to as many questions as we possibly can. So please uh, don't be shy with those questions. Uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Uh, so first up, we have uh, Haley Duncan, who is joining us from Silver Oak and Tuomany Cellars. She's the Safety and Sustainability Manager. Haley is a third generation vintner from Silver Oak. Uh, Haley's grandfather, Ray Duncan, actually co-founded Silver Oak in the early 70s. And her father, Tim Duncan, has worked at the wineries for over 30 years. After graduating uh, from Skidmore College in 2013 with a degree in environmental studies, Haley moved back to California to learn the family business firsthand, working in the vineyards, cellar, and customer service departments. She then became the project manager for the construction of the new Alexander Valley Winery in Hillsburg, specializing in sustainability. Haley has applied her studies to help achieve the first LEED Platinum and Living Building uh, Challenge certifications for the new construction and the wine business. During construction of the new winery, she also led sustainability initiatives at Silver Oaks, Oakville Winery, which became the first existing building certified LEED Platinum in July of 2016. Next, uh, we have Michael Kramer, who is co-founder and head of strategic finance at White Pine Renewables. Michael leads the corporate and project finance group at White Pine Renewables a leading provider of renewable energy to small and medium-sized business customers throughout California. Prior to co-founding White Pine, Michael was director of project finance team at Cypress Creek Renewables from 2015 to 2020. During his time at Cypress Creek, Michael is involved in more than $1 billion of capital raises across the corporate and project finance spectrum and led other key strategic initiatives on the development and operation side of the business. We also have Mac McGowan, who is owner of Stone Edge Vineyard and Farm. Mac grew up in Illinois and earned a mechanical engineering degree from Northwestern and Harvard MBA, later served as a, a naval officer. Mac began his career in finance uh, and joining Wells Fargo in San Francisco in 1964, where he and his colleagues created the first stock index fund. He subsequently founded and built several entrepreneurial businesses. Uh, Mac began collecting wine in the 60s uh, and uh, co-founded the Chalone Wine Group in 1970s with his friend Dick Graf uh, and has been serving on its board uh, for over 25 years. Uh, in 1980, he co-founded co the Tremont Vineyards where Jeff Baker uh, is the winemaker. I actually visited Mac at Stone Edge and done a tour of his one-of-a-kind microgrid system that he will share a lot more about uh, with us here today. And finally, we have Derek Wilkinson, Senior Manager with Moss Adams. Derek practiced public, public uh, accounting since 2011. His experience includes providing tax and compliance and consulting services for real estate construction industries, uh, as well as um, the wine industry. Derek works through complex partnerships, technical matters related to transactions and structuring, and will share with us a little bit more about some of the tax benefits uh, related to sustainable projects that we'll talk about here today. Without further ado, uh, I will now hand it over to uh, my colleague, Jim Kimball, our North Bay Market President, who will moderate today's discussion. Uh, Jim's experience um, is, is long and he has a lot of experience in financing and, and helping uh, wineries um, through, through his banking career. So take it away, Jim. Thanks, Rosa. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're excited about today's program and want to thank our speakers and all of you for being with us this morning. Uh, as most of you know, River City Bank is committed to working with our clients to improve our climate. Uh, we've created a clean energy division of the bank, and we're proud of the fact that uh, we're the bank for 20 of the 25 clean energy companies in California. Uh, which are operational under the Community Choice Aggregation Legislation. Uh, besides providing credit and cash management services to these clients, uh, we also have expertise in renewable energy project finance. Uh, but enough about that, let's dive into our topic. Uh, and, and Haley, I'll direct our first question to you. Uh, we're all familiar with your famous and delicious wines but can you tell us why sustainability is such an important part of Silver Oak? Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I think all wineries sort of feel this way, or at least I would hope they do, is that 
we all rely on the land to make our product, right? And so we can't really be a successful business without a healthy environment. Um, so I think we, we definitely have a vested interest in making sure that our land continues to be um, you know, healthy enough to farm and that we can continue to make our wines. So, you know, it's been, a, it's been an important part of Silver Oak um, since we started, but I think in the last 10 years, we've really been laser focused on implementing programs um, and policies to, you know, just take it to the next level, be even more sustainable, um, you know, have a real plan in place to reduce our use of resources, um, you know, improve our wines, um, invested renewable technologies, um, and so many other things that we're focused on. So I think in a nutshell, you know, we're, we're so connected to the land um, just by, by our business. Um, and I think if we ever become disconnected from that, then we're not gonna be successful. Great. And maybe uh, Amber, if you could put up a picture of, of the Silver Oak facility just to share with the audience. And, and while you show that Haley, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, you know what some of the surprises were along the way as you guys pulled it all together okay I think I understood your question you cut out a little bit um, so this is our Alexander Valley winery so um, this is the first project that I worked on when I came on for the family and this is a photo of our tasting room and then below um, is our winery and so um, there were a lot of challenges in this project. Uh, my task was to achieve both of the certifications that, um, that was mentioned, the Living Building Challenge certification, um, which really no other winery of our size had achieved. Um, the winery and the tasting room um, are over 100,000 square feet. Um, we, we also make um, a huge portion of our wine here, so we use a lot of electricity. Um, and we also needed to um, recycle all of the water that we use um, and find a way to reuse it back into the facility, into this large facility. So I think there were a lot of challenging aspects um, for this project. Um, I also had never uh, worked on a Living Building Challenge project before, so I personally had to do a lot of learning in the first year. This is a photo of the winery just kind of down um, the tasting room is in the in the background um, and you can see we have a lot of solar panels um, and that's because we we expected to use a lot of electricity here uh, we have over 2500 solar panels um, and then it's kind of hard to see but in in the back there um, we have solar thermal panels as well so not just electricity but also all of our hot water um, needed to come from renewable sources and we we weren't um, we couldn't rely on a traditional propane boiler to deliver that for us which is how most wineries get their hot water um, and I would say that that was also very challenging we had never used solar thermal panels before um, we also have a system called um, co2 heat pumps and that's kind of a secondary system that brings the water up to the temperature that we need to clean our equipment in the cellar. Um, so that was that's that was an example of a technology that we had no experience with. And I don't believe um, any winery had ever used the CO2 heat pumps. So we were really the first, the first one to try it out. Um, thankfully it works really well, but I would just say that um, you know we invested in a lot of new technologies that we were very unfamiliar with. And it did take a couple of years to you know, go through that learning curve um, and get to a point where we were really comfortable with it. But we knew that going in, that this wasn't, it wasn't going to be an easy project. Well, and you can look at the pictures and I mean, there's clearly a balance between the functionality of, of the sustainability project, but there's also a beauty to it. I mean, I'd be interested to know what kind of feedback do you get from your clients and, 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 both that come in person, but but maybe also that those that, that read about your sustainability efforts. Yeah, I mean, all of the feedback that we've received has been overwhelmingly positive. I think everyone's been really impressed that we created a green building that was, like you said, not just extremely functional um, and sustainable, but also beautiful. 
And so I think that, you know, the credit really should go to our architects um, mm. for being creative and how they envisioned like this modern barn idea, which is kind of um, the, the theme that runs in the background of the design of the winery. Um, you know, they were also really focused on quality views for, you know, not just customers, but also staff. So, you know, you can see that there's so many windows to the outside because, uh, you know, we're in a gorgeous agricultural area. The property is over 100 acres with vineyards all around. And so we wanted to make the focus on the vineyards and have the buildings be a little bit more in the background. Um, that's kind why we chose a more simple design. Um, the black um, wood siding also kind of hides it a little bit. It's not super flashy, it's very neutral color. Um, and so I think it was important to us that both of those things work together. And I think that's been reflected in the feedback that we've received from customers, just kind of uh, amazed and like very interested in learning all of the, all of the things that went into it. Cause you can tell that it's, it's a very different winery than um, some of the other ones that you might see in the area. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Thank you, Haley. I'd like to direct the next question to you, Mac. Uh, we know sustainability is a passion of yours uh, in addition to winemaking and, and farming. Um, can you share a little bit more about the microgrid project uh, you've built at Stone Edge? With pleasure, Jim, uh, and good morning all. Uh, about Six years ago or so, um, I had the good fortune to encounter uh, an engineer who was interested in uh, uh, putting together solar panels uh, in a, a several sets of arrays on the buildings that represent Stone Edge Farm. Uh, and we began to work uh, on that idea, but it uh, very quickly became uh, clear that we wanted to have batteries. So we, uh, uh, we went to work on looking at a variety of batteries and trying a number of batteries. Uh, and I, I might fast forward to say that today we have nine sets of batteries uh, ranging in size from relatively small buffering batteries to uh, several hundred kWh uh, batteries. Uh, and, and then I think the, Dawn uh, uh, arrived that you can't store enough juice in batteries to go through the winter. So we concluded fairly fast, actually, that we wanted to go to hydrogen. So we found uh, a source of an electrolyzer uh, that uh, transforms uh, rainwater into uh, hydrogen and oxygen and began working with the hydrogen uh, it proved to be very effective. Uh, and the only problem with that initial uh, machine was it was too small. So uh, my, my colleague, uh, Craig, shopped around and we found a Geiner, uh, which is a much larger machine. Uh, in fact, very much larger. Uh, we only need at Stone Edge Farm about uh, eight or nine uh, kilograms uh, a day in the winter. Of course, none in the summer when we have lots of sunshine. Uh, and we we found this Geiner that we had an opportunity to buy that produces about five or six times more uh, hydrogen than we actually need. Uh, and then, of course, the puzzle was how do you uh, want to store it? And you want to put it up to some kind of pressure that's uh, both on the one hand uh, readily doable with conventional pumps. Uh, and in and in vessels or bottles that uh, are kind of off the shelf. So we settled on a, a process of uh, about 3,500 psi, and basically the bottles look like conventional oxyacetylene bottles. <laughs> and uh, then, of course, it became increasingly clear. Uh, and about that time, I had the good fortune of having one of my very close friends, the professor at MIT, come for a visit, and he said to me, uh, this would be a great place for an intern. Richard, I said to uh, 
to Professor Lester, can you get me an intern? Yes, he says, I can do that. So he ended up getting me Jorge, who turns out to be a genius. And he <laughs> created the control system that today operates uh, all 20 distributed energy resources that comprise the microgrid. And every one of those 20 resources has one of his controllers on it uh, that serves the triple purpose of uh, one, converting the native language of each distributed en energy resource uh, into a common language. Second, uh, communicating and orchestrating among the 20 in real time in response to the, the forces at work and the preferences at work. And finally, he stores uh, a large fraction of that data with a sample frequency of one sample per second for each of the 20 resources. So we are inundated with data. Uh, and of course, the next exercise was to develop uh, the analytics to interpret the data and uh, understand what it was we had our hands on. So I'd say, uh, uh, it's been a lot, of course, trial and error all the way along. Uh, it's turned out that there were surprisingly few errors, uh, mm -hmm. but by no means none. <laughs> and uh, today, uh, we, I can tell you that we've been running in island mode, uh, meaning we haven't been connected for energy or, or to provide energy to PG&E since uh, the 20th of December, 2019. So we've been running wow. flawlessly for uh, 20 months or thereabouts. And uh, it provides well more than uh, the energy requirement for the farm, which is actually pretty substantial. Uh, and our marginal cost of electricity is zero. <laughs> our marginal carbon footprint is zero. Uh, and the entire economic picture swings on the capital investment, which is coming down rapidly. Uh, one of my MIT friends, uh, uh, Vladimir, tells me that the cost of photovoltaic panels has already come down 98.6% in the last three decades. And his prophecy is that it'll go down another 90% in the next decade. So that, uh, and we have about 650 solar panels. Uh, of, from three different manufacturers, uh, just because we were interested in trying to discover whether there were any material differences uh, among those three, and uh, we conclude there is not. So when all is said and done, it has become a, a bellwether uh, microgrid that has gone, gotten vastly more attention than I could possibly have imagined. <laughs> uh, and that certainly wasn't the intent. The intent was to try to figure out how to solve the energy problem. And I think the most innovative and interesting part of it uh, for me, and I think for Craig too, uh, parenthetically, would you believe Craig actually died on the job a couple of years ago? So I can't give him as much credit as I would like because he deserves a, a large round of applause. But the really important part of the, of the, I think, discovery has been hydrogen. Uh, not only is it safe and readily available, but it's super efficient. It has about four and a half times the efficiency of an internal combustion engine. So when you talk about creating a backup in the form of diesel generators or whatever, I mean, that hydrogen just outclasses it by a huge margin. And uh, there's just no limit to how much hydrogen we can produce. In fact, I'm quite confident that the time will soon come when you can produce hydrogen from rainwater as well as salt water, which means you're not even gonna need much, much fresh water to do it. And I'll just end with one more comment and that is we've done some calculations, Jorge and I have, about what fraction of the uh, 19 inches of rain that we get annually, uh, at least that's the expectation, not, not this year, but uh, we have one building that is uh, got a footprint of about 2,800 square feet. And there's about 
20 times as much uh, rain comes down on that roof annually as is needed to power the entire farm with hydrogen in the winter months. So hydrogen is clearly the, uh, the answer. I shall stop. Uh, I shall stop there and see if you have any comments or questions, Jim, or anybody else. Yeah, no, Mac, it's, it's, it's very impressive. And, and uh, I think as you, as you walk through it, the complexity of what you've done and, and the simplicity in which you explain it um, is, is, a, is truly an art form. But I, I guess what I would ask is when, when you have clients come to visit your winery, I'm sure there's a percentage that come to see the grid and, and, and come to, and, and taste the wine while they're there and, and vice versa. I mean, what kind of feedback are you getting from, your clients and what new clients are you just generating because of interest in your grid? Well, there, there resides a very good question, Jim. And uh, let me just say this, compared to Silver Oak, and I've known Justin, by the way, from when he was at Christian Brothers. Uh -huh. So uh, I'm very familiar with him. Uh, and or, or I, I I'm not even sure he's still around. I mean, Haley, is he, he's not, I don't think, right? Yeah. No, no, he passed away a long time ago. But Yeah, yeah. that's what I thought. But uh, I knew Justin at Christian Brothers, uh, along with a number of other people in the, in the Napa Valley at the time. Um, but when you come right down to the scale of Stone Edge Farm relative to Silver Oak, or, or one of the other important wineries in Napa, we only produce about 3,500 cases mm -hmm. annually from physically two different properties. Stone Edge Farm has, we have a companion vineyard up in the mountains called Sil Silver Cloud. Uh, it's all Cabernet. Uh, and so the scale of it is small mm -hmm. in relation to a lot of the wineries in uh, Napa and Sonoma. The main feature, uh, that we decided to add about seven or eight years ago was um, in essence a, 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 a tasting room that is actually a restaurant. Hmm. Uh, we call it Edge. It's in downtown Sonoma. And I would say that about 90%, maybe even more of the new business development that emerges uh, for us are people who come to dine at Edge. Hmm. Where, where we serve our wine, and we also serve uh, competitive wines, mostly French, but we also have a menu of California, by the way, including Silver Oak, <laughs> and uh, people have an opportunity to pick another wine to taste in parallel with our wines, uh, and in our particular case, we only really make two red wines. Uh, the premier wine and then the second label. Now that doesn't, uh, I don't want to detract from the fact we also produce a small quantity of Sauvignon Blanc Semillon, uh, but that's not the main focus of Stone Edge Farm by any stretch. So the, the way we, we don't actually have a tasting room per se, and we don't, first of all, we just don't have anywhere near enough product. Uh, we have no wholesale distribution at all. 100% uh, of our wine is sold either uh, at Edge or on a mailing list or direct to our co collectors. And we are actually short of supply. We don't have enough wine uh, and there's no remedy for that. We're, we have as much as we're gonna, we're gonna have. Uh, now there's, we have a, a couple of vineyards, about six or seven acres uh, taken together of the two that we planted about five or six years ago up at Silver Cloud. So we will have some additional production in the next few years, uh, but that'll be the end of it from our point of view. Right. So I shall stop there and uh, see if anybody has some comments or questions or whatever. Wonderful, Mac, thank you so much. And we'll have an opportunity at the end for the audience to to give some questions, but your presentation was great and, and uh, very interesting. Maybe we could switch gears a little bit and Michael go to you and, and as a solar developer that, that has experience with various types of businesses with their energy and solar or their energy storage products and solar. Um, can you share with our audience how 
a company might start looking into their sustainable options and what the cost benefits are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll say for one to begin with here that if anybody wants a glimpse into the future, what we just heard from Mac is what's going to be the norm in five to 10 years, but it's amazing that that's happening right now. Um, as of today in, in 2021, um, you know, we're, we're leaps and bounds further than we were even a decade ago. And, and what Mac was saying about the price of solar panels falling dramatically, um, the rise of battery storage is, is definitely creating a landscape that was really unthinkable 10 years ago. And we'll probably be similarly, you know, where we'll be in 10 years from now. Um, we'll look back on today and, and talk about how we were in the Stone Age. Um, but the good news for, for now is that solar is usually a winner right off the bat these days in California. Um, as everybody on this call knows, I'm sure uh, PG&E electricity rates have been going nowhere but up. Um, and solar costs, um, installation and equipment have been going down just as rapidly. Um, so what we at White Pine do and many other developers will do um, throughout the state is um, we are... Uh, we think of ourselves as similar to equipment leasing companies. So we will work with wineries, uh, farming um, businesses, municipalities, government agencies, and um, deliver them a solar project, but in a way where we will actually take responsibility for all of the development, permitting, construction, um, and then ongoing ownership and operations with our relationship with our customers being through what's called a power purchase agreement or a PPA. Um, what that does is it enables our customers to be buying electricity directly from the solar farm. The solar farm is usually you know, located on um, a roof, uh, it can be on the ground, it can be on a pond. Um, and it, it enables um, you know, customers, whether they be wineries or, um, or others, to uh, realize the cost savings that solar can provide relative to what they would otherwise be paying PG&E uh, for a kilowatt hour from PG&E's grid without having to um, take on the capital expenditure and ongoing maintenance and operational uh, burden of, of solar farms. Um, so the, um, you know, the, the baseline there that we see increasingly throughout the state is that there is a, um, you know, a really strong appetite for you know, on-site solar. Um, from a customer perspective, there's certainly an ability to you know, approach it um, either from an upfront perspective where um, if desired, you know, you can take on a project yourself, you can own the panels, there's tax credits associated with these investments, uh, which, which help to alleviate some of the upfront capital expenditure. Uh, and that's the right answer for, for some people. Um, but for the customers that we work with, they really do like the element of zero upfront cost and no long-term maintenance obligations um, for a, a product that's not necessarily, you know, in their core expertise, you know, be it winemaking or, or otherwise. Um, a few other considerations, especially in wine country, um, land availability can be really challenging, um, you know, especially with the highest and best use of, of scarce resources and scarce land being to grow grapes. Um, we worked on a project last year in the city of Healdsburg, uh, where we built a five megawatt uh, solar array on the city's uh, wastewater treatment ponds. So it was not taking up space that was otherwise used for growing grapes um, or agricultural operations. Um, and many wineries have similar, you know, small um, irrigation ponds available and, and siting solar on those ponds can bring a lot of benefits, both in terms of not uh, taking up otherwise scarce land um, and also preventing um, evaporation that can occur. Uh, the, the solar panels covering the surface of those irrigation ponds really does prevent a substantial amount of evaporation that would otherwise occur. Um, Rooftop is also a, you know, a, a choice that we see many winemakers making as well, given the, the large, um, large roof space that's available. Um, so you know, considerations in general um, at, at the outset come down to um, you know, whether you wanna own the system outright or whether you want somebody else to own it, operate it, take care of it, and then you know, sell you the power under a long-term contract. Um, the land availability, availability question is always a key one uh, as well. And then as we go into the future, um, there is also frequently a conversation we're having with our customers where um, you know, the question of, should I add a battery? Should I add a microgrid um, comes into play? And it's not necessarily as clear of an economic argument upfront in the sense that solar, you can draw a direct line to say, if you install this, you will save X. And you know, it's a very, very simple proposition. You know, batteries are an additional cost. Cost um, as a result, it, it you know pushes up the rate that you'll pay for your electricity. But the benefit of batteries, um, and, and it's topical this week where PG&E is talking about more public safety 
and power shutoffs is that they provide you know backup power. They can better enable customers to um, you know shift their electricity consumption to times of the day where power is cheaper. Um, and so batteries you know are very much on the same trajectory that solar was maybe ten years ago or so, where the technology is rapidly improving, the cost is rapidly coming down, and um, you know, today we see many customers wanting to go with a battery option, not necessarily for the clear year one economic argument, but really for the view that over the course of a 15, 20, 25 year investment, having that battery will be a real asset um, that will enable them to both have resiliency and also, um, you know, evolve as the technology evolves um, to, to enable um, them to, to really, you know, use their electricity in as sophisticated a manner as possible. Um, the, the other thing I'd note is that, um, you know, we, we as, the, as developers are out there talking to a number of clients. Um, in many cases, you know, one of the early um, uh, discussions, you know, is kind of a baseline overview of how the system works in California. Um, you know, what's the right answer for, for customers? Um, there's also, I think, a, a good network out there of people who are, I would say, kind of on the customer advocacy or consulting side of things that aren't themselves building these projects, but can really serve as good, um, good consultants and advisors for people that are interested in getting into solar, um, you know, without kind of, you know, well being on your side of the table, so to speak. Um, one company that we work with frequently in the wine country is called Spiral Energy, um, who I highly recommend for, for folks that are interested in kind of reaching out for a friendly consultation and, and um, you know, kind of a, a good advocate on their behalf to help them talk with developers or other service providers that are out there um, offering solutions. So it's an exciting time, um, you know, obviously difficult with, with PG&E rates going up and, and other challenges, but also the technology is evolving rapidly and, and the, the economic equation is getting better and better uh, every year. Great. Thanks a lot, Michael. I appreciate you breaking that down. And, and uh, I'm sure we'll come back with some questions here. Derek, I wanted to turn to you uh, being our uh, resident uh, CPA, and, and you've got clear expertise and, and experience working with wineries regarding their tax planning. Could you share some of the trends you're seeing in the industry and how it relates to sustainability and how this impacts their overall financial performance and, and, and general tax benefits? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Jim. Um, and so these these projects are are super impressive. Um, kind of coming, you know, out of those, there are tax incentives around, um, you know, potentially putting projects like these through. Um, the first one that has become permanent is is the 179D deduction, which it's related to commercial building owners that um, that put together, you know, efficient systems and the, the government's kind of set a, uh, a minimum. And if, if the systems hit you know, over 50% efficiency, you could potentially get a, uh, a deduction on uh, the building systems. The current deduction is $1.80 per square foot. So you know, the clients that have, have good you know, uh, benefits from these are kind of large warehousing generally. Um, and you know the 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 part around a little bit of difficulty is you have to get this certified. So it's a you know like a third party engineer that has to come in and you know kind of you know tick off the systems. Um, but it's something that's out there. It's permanent. Um, we're we're seeing it. Uh, the cool thing with these is you can go back. So you know you could potentially go back a number of years if you you know did these uh, new projects or, or building systems. You could potentially go back, get a review, see if there's some credits that you can take uh, in the current year. Um, so that's the 179D. Uh, the other piece is R&D credits. So that's you know one one area where you think R&D. You, you know, most people think you know manufacturing, um, but we've had some good traction in the production, wine production as well as agriculture space. Um, so R&D is is all about uncertainty. So it's any time that you're kind of going into you know, a new process, a new project, and you're, you're not certain of the outcome, uh, you're not even certain if, if this thing's gonna work, um, that process, that timeline is, is potentially good for, for R&D credits. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the, the other cool thing is you don't, it doesn't have to be kind of a new process to the world. It's, it's something that's just new to your, your business, to your company that you're kind of taking on. 
Um, you're seeing you know, other competitors in, in the market doing it. You're, you're, you're you know, looking to take that on. Um, the, the portion that you want to look for the R&D credits, there's, there's three places. They're, they're driven off the cost of the project. So the big one we see are you know, labor costs. Uh, so that's direct labor or supervisors during you know, that project. Um, materials is a, is a second one. And then third party uh, costs, whether you're working with you know, engineers uh, or another kind of third party there. Um, a few activities that we have seen in kind of sustainability realm, obviously smoke taint is, is one. Uh, you know, anytime that you are, are working to get that you know, smoke out of you know, the finished goods, uh, you're kind of taking on a process that you're not sure it's going to work. We've had some good success there. Um, on the farming side, uh, you know, uh, activities around like dry irrigation, um, you know, cultivation, anything kind of drought related that you're taking on, you know, a new project that you're not sure is going to work. Um, wastewater treatment, um, CO2 recapture, things like, you know, in the sustainability realm. Um, as well as you know, kind of new systems around automation, around you know labor shortages, um, and and so yeah, those are those are a couple that we've we've seen recently, you know, where where a lot of people think, okay, you know, let's take a step back. Are, are we doing something new? Um, is there some sort of you know science to it? Uh, and we've had some good credits come from from that. Well, I mean, clearly there's there's a level of complexity to it that requires some experience and judgment, I think, from, from uh, you and others like you. Um, with that in mind, I mean, at what point in the process would you recommend a client engage you to sort of, as they start on this endeavor, um, because it's, it's all about the, the planning of the process. I think, you know, Haley and Macleth talked about that, and as did Michael. Uh, at what point is, as, as the company's CPA consultant, would you like to be engaged in this? Yeah, so uh, proactive is, is always the best in, in my mind. You know, loop, loop your CPA in early on. Um, you know, the, generally, you know, most of this we can kind of go back and, and try to document, you know, on the back end. But, you know, especially around like the 179D, if you are kind of undertaking, you know, building projects, loop in your CPA early. You know, there may be things that in terms of tracking or documentation or, or things going a certain way that would be, you know, helpful on the front end, um, kind of as you're taking the project. And, and, you know, we like to partner with you and, and kind of help you through the whole process versus, you know, just kind of going on, you know, once everything's done and, and, you know, documenting. So, yeah, I mean, as early as possible, you know, loop in your CPA, I think it'd be helpful. Always sage advice. Um, it's great. Thank you very much, Derek. Um, this is a question really more for the, for the whole panel and, um, you know, and in, in, in specifically with the wine industry, I mean, there, there are certainly inherent risks associated with wine production, with agriculture in general, uh, and we're seeing more climate related risks kind of manifest themselves, whether it be the, you know, as, as uh, Mike was talking about earlier, the power, um, the public safety power shutoffs are now a regular occurrence in California. Uh, wildfires, drought, rising temperatures. I mean, what do you see as sort of the mitigating strategies against these risks manifesting themselves? And how's your business sort of planning to address these in the future? Kind of throw it out there and, and, and kind of feel free to, to chime in. Anyone? Yeah, I can start. Sure. Um, so obviously this is not the greenest solution, but I think in the short term, we've had to rely on generators to get us through these shutoff events. Mm -hmm. um, we've had several times where we've had uh, no power during harvest. And I'm sure I'm not the only winery to have that problem. Um, so some of our wineries have permanent generators where we were not you know, uh, transporting generators from facility to facility, but others don't. So we've had to plan a little bit for that to make sure that every winery has power. Um, 
it's honestly been a little chaotic um, trying to figure out how to make sure because we have several properties to make sure that um, they all have power during harvest. Uh, you know, that's not a long-term solution, but that's something that we've had to invest in um, just in the last couple of years to make sure that we can continue to make wine. Um, you know, we also recently trained a lot of our essential staff in a basic like firefighting course so that if they are in an evacuated zone, they can get back in and continue to make our wines. Um, and so we just completed that earlier this year. We trained, I think, like 50 or 60 people. Um, so I think that's something that wineries could consider, you know, just so that they can get back in and continue, continue on with harvest. Um, of course, there's so many other things that, you know, we need to start thinking about, you know, defensible space. Uh, a lot of our wineries have wastewater treatment ponds that, you know, could protect us if we needed it. Um, so I think we have some, we have some short-term solutions, but there's definitely more long-term thinking that we all need to do. Great. Well, Mac, I'm sure you're glad you've been in island mode for uh, a year and a half. Yes. <laughs> um, well, I, I think Haley's comments uh, very much mirror my own. Uh, what we have put an awful lot of effort into is water. Mm. Um, we have a full-time, I call him the water king, <laughs> uh, who deals with um, uh, the, and we, and uh, bear in mind, no, we, have, we also, we don't have as many properties by any means as Haley does, but we have, we have four and uh, and that includes the winery it, itself, as well as the restaurant at plus two vineyards. Uh, now, uh, every one of those properties presents a different water issue. Um, for example, one of the, at the vineyard up in Silver Cloud, we have artesianing water that comes trickling out of the ground. Um, and even in these conditions, it's still trickling, not as much as it would normally instead of about five or six uh, GPM, it's about half that. Um, the water table in the valley where Stonehenge Farm itself is, is down probably about uh, three or four feet. Uh, and, and that means, for example, our, our shallowest well is dry. Um, uh, and that's at about, that's about 250 or 260 feet. It's a, it's a legacy well, it's been around for, I don't even know, 50, 60 years, I guess. Um, and we have uh, three deep wells that are over 500 feet. And they also have diminished uh, uh, capacity. Um, and uh, except one, one is diminished somewhat, but not, not that much. But the point of the matter is, it brings to mind the need for ever more conservation. Uh, it also brings to mind the possibility of using rainwater, assuming we do get some rain. Uh, and uh, we're working on that idea. Uh, we're also concerned about fires, which is uh, again, the point that everybody is raising in effect. Um, and we've done an awful lot of work to uh, uh, Let's, let's call it uh, the fringes of the properties being very careful about the, the burnable ma materials that are uh, both on the property, but really at the fringes. Uh, we have a, a, a host of, let me call them uh, smaller uh, pursuits uh, that range from uh, just uh, how, many, how many GPM we actually require uh, on, on uh, the few grass uh, uh, that we actually have. Uh, and I've eliminated uh, two of the five. Uh, and they're not very big in the first place, but the total remaining grasses probably don't occupy more than a quarter of an acre. Uh, but in any event, uh, we've, we've done a lot of things that uh, I would not have thought about as recently as even a year ago. I'm afraid that we're into a period 
Um, let me let me say, by the way, that um, I'm I'm involved with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and have been for more than two decades. So I've learned a lot from my colleagues, uh, my scientific colleagues there, about various aspects of sustainability. Uh, and it's a pretty sobering learning curve. Uh, and I'm confident that uh, we are in a period in which um, that could easily persist. Uh, in fact, it could become the norm. And if that's the case, I think not only are we going to have to deal with remedial uh, circumstances, but we're going to have to fundamentally change our way of doing business. Uh, Phil Katuri, uh, my partner who attends our vineyards, who's been in the Sonoma Valley uh, his entire life, uh, 60, 60 some years. His family has been in the farming business for that entire period and even longer. Uh, we talk frequently about um, uh, how to deal with, um, uh, with this problem. We long ago gave up on sprinklers. Uh, in fact, we long ago gave up on, on watering um, mature vineyard. We don't, we don't water mature vineyard at all. The only time we use uh, water in the vineyard is to bring up a young vineyard. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, we only have a small, uh, we only have really two small plots uh, in which uh, the vines still require a small amount of water, but we've even cut that back. So uh, I, we're, I think we're in a period in which uh, it's more than likely to persist for the indefinite future. Uh, so I think we're gonna have to get used to where we are uh, and I think that's going to be true for the totality of all human beings, not, not just uh, uh, wineries and vineyardists. So uh, I'll just stop there. Oh, great. I appreciate that, Mac. You know, it might be a good time to check in. And, and Rosa, I'm not sure if we've accumulated any questions for the audience, but, or for the panelists from the audience, but I'd love to, love to bring the audience in if we could. Yeah, thank you. Great, great conversation so far. So we do have a few questions from the audience. Um, one is about the impact of batteries. So I, th I think this is a little bit of a, a loaded question, um, mm -hmm. but um, you know maybe uh, Michael um, can 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 take this one. Uh, so what are the long term environmental impact of, of batteries, um, and what is the potential res uh, recycling options uh, after they no longer work efficiently? Sure. Thanks, Rosa. Um, the, the long and short of it is that many of the materials in batteries are recyclable once they reach the end of their useful life. Um, what we've seen in the solar space in particular is that as the first generation of solar panels uh, reaches the end of its useful life, there has been a pretty robust industry that's sprung up to recycle those um, and extract a good amount of salvage value from panels. Um, similar to to um, you know, panels, the kind of the analysis is the upfront input costs and uh, footprint to create solar panels and batteries versus the ongoing energy production you get over their lives. And in both cases, it should very much be net positive. But I think in the battery case, you know, we haven't really gotten to the point where batteries have been you know, in use at an industrial scale for long enough to begin to need to be recycled. Um, but given kind of historical trends and how solar has been working, um, I think it's pretty reasonable to expect that you'll see a good industry spring up as you reach the end of life for batteries um, that will be looking at innovative ways to, to make the most out of reusing the materials uh, that are in there. Great, thank you. Uh, so let's see here, so we've got a number of questions. Um, so we've got one other question here, um, it, a little bit more of a comment and, and also a question. So I'll throw this out to the panel. Um, all this seems a little bit overwhelming to digest. Uh, any suggestions on how to start um, the sustainability uh, efforts and, and planning? So uh, perhaps Haley, uh, given your, your, uh, your work at, at Silver Oak, you could uh, take a stab at that one. Sure, I mean, for us, you know, just thinking about the Alexander Valley Winery, where we had these huge goals um, and every aspect of the project needed to be looked at through the lens of sustainability. Um, we really just took it one thing at a time, one day at a time. Um, so I would just pick, pick a project that, you know, you're interested in pursuing 
um, and just see, see how that goes. Um, and then pick the next project. I wouldn't worry too much about writing out a detailed plan if you're just starting out or if you're a small business, that might not be the most important thing. Um, the most important thing is probably just getting, getting a project started. Maybe it's renewable energy, maybe it's water recycling. You know, I think just pick, pick one, um, finish it, and then, and then move on to your next one would be my advice. Great, thank you. Uh, and I think we have time for at least one more question before we wrap up. Um, so this one's a little bit related to the last one about planning and um, you know where to start. Um, it's a question that came in about how do wineries typically finance these types of sustainability projects? So um, I think we heard a little bit from the panel about the different ways where some some wineries own the assets themselves and then they um, they, they can finance it. And then, you know, we've, we've got the sort of the, the, uh, uh, the white pine uh, solution where there's um, a third party that owns it. And then Derek talked a little bit about tax credits. So uh, who wants to take that question and try to, uh, I guess, unravel how a winery would um, decide uh, if they should finance it or um, go through kind of the power purchase agreement option? I'm happy to, to give a quick bit of insight here from the white pine side since we, we pretty frequently have these conversations. Um, usually, you know, there's usually kind of a joint sustainability approach that our customers take when they're wanting to look at solar and storage and also an economic approach. Um, on the economic side specifically, we um, generally tend to present options to customers to decide what they wanna do. Usually the feedback that we'll hear is, you know, I, you know, really know well, you know, my core business of whatever, you know, agriculture, wine, whatever it may be. And I'm pretty confident that I can earn, you know, X percent returns. Um, if I invest $100 into, you know, my core business, I can run the numbers on my, my solar and I can determine that I'm going to earn, you know, X minus Y or, you know, it, it, it's rarely the, the return on investment for the solar is rarely greater than the return on investment for our customers of investing money into their core business, which is what drives a lot of them to PPAs uh, and, and kind of an off balance sheet solution there. Um, but it could be as simple as that of just kind of having a sense of, you know, what an incremental dollar invested in your core business will, will earn you from a returns perspective versus what that dollar invested into solar um, or other energy um, solutions would, would earn you. Those numbers can obviously change depending on what the rates that a customer is paying for electricity, um, depending on their tax appetite, um, but what we've generally found is that for, for many customers, the right option is to, you know, let us as a third party, you know, handle the development, the permitting, the installation, the operation, the maintenance, and realize their economic benefits over the course of the lifetime of the project as they save money on their electricity uh, and achieve other goals. But certainly the answer can vary for, for different folks. And so I think it's just a good kind of side-by-side -side comparison to do as you begin to think about the opportunity. Great, that, that was a, a great answer. Uh, Derek, do you have anything to add to that from, from a CPA or, or tax perspective before we wrap up? Um, no, I mean, I think it could come down to cash flow as well. I mean, that's what we've seen. Um, and then, you know, generally we say let the economics, you know, drive the decision and then let kind of the tax, you know, come on the back end. But, you know, there are credits around, you know, purchasing solar. Um, and so that could come into the, the formula of, of, you know, how beneficial and and how to how to kind of you know finance or, or purchase, but um, yeah, I mean, I think Michael you know did a great job in his answer. Great, thank you. Well, I, I think we're we're uh, um, coming up uh, towards the the hour. Um, any any parting words from any of our panelists before we close out and and uh, thank thank all of our attendees for for joining us here today. All right, well, Jim, thank you for, for moderating. Uh, thank you to our panel and thank you to all of our clients uh, on the call. Uh, and for those of you who are not clients yet, uh, we welcome your business and we hope we can help your business plan for the future as you think about um, different uh, sustainability options um, and, and how to finance them. So thank you for joining today and we will be sending a recording of the webinar uh, out to all attendees uh, likely by the end of this week. Thank you. Thank you all.